Hello again, and today's lecture is going to be on transfer function realization based on the Z transform. So, in particular, any Z transform in Fourier transform will allow us to derive several equivalent ways to describe a system, and these ways can either be the transfer function form, known as H of Z, the frequency C response, known as H of capital omega, a pole zero arrangement or a pole zero plot an impulse response known as H of N, and an input-output difference equation in particular. The one we're going to be looking at today is the block diagram description in particular. So whenever we are designing anything in respect to like a filter or a system or something, the first thing that we try to figure out is what is going to be the frequency response management that is or the frequency response requirement for that entire system itself. So we start with our input frequency requirement and we design it regards to h of omega. And then once we have the h of omega, we then do our filter design method and then we form our h of z. h of z can be rep represented in all different forms. So we can do the inverse z transform and we can get h of n. We can do a pole zero plot. We can formulate a difference equation for it. Or we can actually do a block diagram. Over the next few lectures in this entire series, we're going to be watching in particular how we're going to be doing the filter design method. In particular, we will be looking for digital filter design. It will be the finite impulse response or FIR filters and the infinite impulse response or IIR filters. So let's assume that we have some transfer function here and we need to find out what is going to be our H of N, assuming that the H of Z is causal. So, how do we do this? Well, typically what we tend to do, because we assume that it's some sort of finite response, is that we'll express this into partial fractions, which we can do here. And the reason for this in particular is that, remember the degree of the numerator here and the degree of the denominator here are the same. And while for partial fractions to occur, the degree of the numerator must be less than the degree of the denominator. So we long divide once and we get our remainder here accordingly and all we also have, no we have a quotient here accordingly sorry, and we have our remainder divided by the original denominator here. So once we have it in this form we can then partial fraction accordingly and we can solve for A and B. So A here will work out to be negative 2.5 and B will be 7.5. We then use the Z transform tables to get our inverse Z transform accordingly. Once we have this, the next question we may ask, okay, we have our H of N, but let's say we wanted a difference equation instead for satisfying H of N. So we start off with our H of Z again, and we can rewrite it into this form here. We can rearrange it, so that way, we try to make sure that we have h of z on the left hand side by itself. Or we can have it h of z and h of z. We can have two h of z's on the left hand side and on the right hand side. But h of z must be on the left hand side accordingly. We can then apply our z transform delay property and an inverse z transform it to figure out, okay, how do we get our difference equation? So in this case, the inverse Z transform here of H of Z just goes to H of N. Because we see there's a Z to the negative 1 property here with our H of Z, this is going to be a delay of N minus 1. So this is going to be H N minus 1. The constant term in front here just directly transfers. 5 just transfers to delta of N. And wherever there's a Z to the negative 1, that's going to be delta of N minus 1 accordingly. The 2 here just transfers. So this particular arrangement is when we have an infinite response. So this actually gives us a difference equation in terms of if we're solving for infinite response for regarding the equation. The third form that we may want to ask is, okay, what is the input-output difference equation? So we start off by plotting this regards to y of z and x of z, where y of z is our output and x of z is our inputs here. The h of z is going to be our transfer function that we've been seeing all the time. The same approach as before will give us 
our difference equation here accordingly. Now, typically, if we substituted our x of n equal to delta of n, we're basically going to get the same h of n equation that we saw in the previous slide. The last form is, okay, we have our y of n here. How do we obtain some sort of block diagram for this? So we put all our inputs on the left hand side. So we have our x of n here, and then we have our x of n minus one. And we keep the we keep the top level of our diagram here to be where we have no delays. And then the next level here is going to be where you have one delay. If there was a second delay, there'll be another level underneath here that's going to be our second delay accordingly. We then watch what our scalar factors are with respect to x of n and x of n minus 1. And in that case, we are already taking care of these inputs here. Because remember, x here is going to be our inputs and we plot it on the left hand side. So the x of n here multiplied by 5 covers this part here. And the 2x of n minus 1 covers this part here accordingly. The only thing we haven't catered for as yet is this plus sign, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The next thing we're going to cater for is our outputs, which is going to be mapped onto the right hand side here accordingly. Y of n here has no scalar input for so we just leave a blank line here because the blank line here assumes that it is a gain of 1. But the y of n minus 1 here has a scalar input of 0 0.8, so it has to show up here accordingly. So now that we've catered for the y of n, x of n, y of n minus 1, and x of n minus 1, we now have to make sure that everything here sums up accordingly. So there's a plus sign here and there's a plus sign here, so that means we could just put one plus sign accordingly to do all the summations. And in that case, we formulate our block diagram here. So the processing sequence for this, if we are reading this from the block diagram and let's say we didn't have the equation, is that x of n will be received first, and then we process y of n being equal to 5x of n. So this is basically like a new state that comes in. x of n is then shifted or delayed to x of n minus 1, and y of n is also shifted or delayed to y of n minus 1. So the pass input and the pass output in this case have been stored. The new x of n is received, and it does the processing again. And in that case, we watch where, in this case, where we have the n minus 1s, these are the store values. But when the new x of n comes in, it does the same processing as before, and the entire process just keeps on repeating for new delays as of such. So this block diagram form here is referred to as a direct form realization. So we can use standard blocks here, or we can use our standard symbols here accordingly, as we can see in this block diagram. And basically, any block diagram is basically a depiction of how the trans function is calculated on a sample by sample basis. So, if we take our transfer function here and we compare the symbols with the equations, we basically can see where everything maps out accordingly. We can see here that the numerator that was being multiplied by x or z, the 5 is here, the 2 is here accordingly. The z to negative 1 is here as well. Everything that was on the denominator, which will end up being multiplied by y of z if we cross multiply. This 1 is going to be here. And the 0 0.8 here is here as well. And because you have a negative sign here, it transfers this negative 0 0.8 accordingly. The summation of all the entire things goes up to a series of summation points here along this vertical path. So, a generic first order system with no initial conditions follows this form here, and it can be arranged accordingly or expressed into this new form. Let's say if we decide to draw this out. In drawing this out, we can see here that basically we map all our inputs here onto the left hand side and our outputs here onto the right hand side. And we stack our delays accordingly. So this will be the Z minus 1 level. If we had a z minus 2, we'll be underneath here as of such. So this form here is referred to as the direct form realization as well. Now, P 
pay particular attention to this block diagram because this is for a first order generic system. We want to come back to it in a little bit. Let's actually observe what happens with a second order system. So the second order system general equation is given by this green block here. If we block diagram this accordingly, it ends up looking like this. Now, remember that first order system that we just not watch? If we watch this part here only, where the laser pointer is going around, doesn't that look very similar to our first order system? So this gives you an indicator that the first order system is actually a building block for a second order system accordingly. And the second order system just only has these Z negative one delays here and our new constants here that associate with them. So when we filter down here and here accordingly, Z to negative one multiplied by Z to negative one will indicate this is going to be our Z to negative two delay line here. A given transfer function can be realized in very several configurations. And in reality, this is dependent on the hardware and software you're going to be using, but it's important to know how you can transfer any transfer function into its block diagram representation accordingly using those simple steps that we saw in the previous slides. So in general, the form that we have seen so far is the direct form. There are a few other forms that we need to pay attention to. In particular, the canonical form, the cascade form, and the parallel form. Now, one thing to note about block diagrams. We can see here that because all the arrows from the input are pointing towards the right, going towards the output, this is referred to as a feed-forward structure. However, on the output side, because they're pointing towards the left, heading back towards the input, this is referred to as a feedback structure. A feedforward structure is also referred to as a non-recursive structure because everything just goes in one solid direction. It goes from left to right, from input to output. Nothing goes back towards the input. So as of such, we use no past values of the output. So no pass values of y of n. A non-recursive structure or a feedforward structure creates a transfer function which is used for a finite impulse response or FIR. A feedback structure on the other hand is referred to as a recursive structure because of this feedback loop that exists and all other several feedback loops that may also exist throughout the entire system. In this case, the pass values of the output y of n is going to be used. And this creates a transfer function for infinite impulse response or IIR. Any general transfer function is going to be a product of the recursive and non-recursive systems accordingly. And we can rearrange them accordingly and we can get a W of Z factor here. And we can see W of Z is going to be X of Z all over entire expansion polynomial here on the denominator. And because we deal with linear time invariant systems, we can evaluate y of z in any order. So if we actually watch where this w of z here looks on the graph itself, sorry, on the block diagram itself, it's basically this entire column here of just delays. And we're using the direct form here in particular to highlight how we move from the direct form to the canonical form by using this W of Z here. So the LTI system basically can be cascaded in any order. So that means we can interchange recursive and non-recursive parts into any form that we wish. And because we are watching that W of Z column where all the delays were lined up, it basically means that these delays here, because they're on the same level, they're just repeated. So we don't need all these delays. We can just eliminate one set of delays here accordingly and just connect the arrows to this existing delay. And because we eliminate this entire set here, and we just map these, these arrows here to the existing delays here, this is referred to as the canonical form, which we can observe here. 
So the canonical form is basically eliminating the repetition blocks that existed in the direct form. If we generated our previous example in MATLAB, it basically looks like this for the canonical form. Remember that if you're going to generate this as a MATLAB, MATLAB does not start at index 0, it starts at index 1. Now, we can also have a generic transfer function in point order orders to numerator and denominator, and we can factor this into first order and second order polynomials. So as a such, a transfer function may end up being a series of multiplications of sub-transfer functions. When there's a series of multiplications of these functions here accordingly, this is referred to as a cascade representation. So, if we start with our first order system here, we can buy our generic transfer function, which we can see here, and we move to a second order system here, which is given by this generic transfer function here. If we cascade the two, and we plot it here accordingly, we take our first order system here, and then we take the output of the first order system, and we multiply it into the input of the second order, and we get our new output here accordingly. Either one of these blocks here could be a direct form or a canonical form, but what matters here if I cascade the system is that they keep on multiplying accordingly. So a cascade system is a good idea of how serial operations work because they rely on the input of one part to feed it, they rely on the output of one part, sorry, to feed into the input of another part accordingly. And the reason for it being serial is because they just connect and chain together accordingly. In this case, we minimize storage because we're just using one set of storage here as we keep on going along the, from left to right here in the, serial, in the serial line. An example question may come where we may be given a transfer function here and you may be asked to sketch it in canonical representation. Well, this is just quite simple because we just need to factorize the denominator and the numerator and just break it up into a series of multiplications. So we can just factorize the denominator here and then because the denominator is factorized here we can also factorize the numerator if we wish or we can leave it alone and then we can just say section 1 here can just be this part here which can be multiplied here accordingly and section 2 here can be our remainder part here which can just multiply here accordingly as well. The last realization is if we take our generic transfer function here and we separate it into some individual transfer functions by using partial fractions. So as such, we end up getting a series of sub-transfer functions here adding together. When they add together, this is referred to as a parallel representation. A parallel representation uses more memory, but it minimizes the processing time. So as of such, these transfer functions here being like this is what h1 or h2 stack vertically and they process at the same time accordingly for each one of these blocks. So all of these here will process within like one generic cycle and produce the output. But the downside is you're going to need memory for this block here and then memory here for this block here accordingly as of such. So your memory requirements increase. So this brings us to the end of the direct form realization lecture. In particular, what we observe is how we can represent block diagrams in four forms. The direct form, the canonical form, the cascade form, and the parallel form.